each game one by one, year by year. We will look at, amongst other things, the players, the venues, the history, football and changes, and the quirky stories. I'm Steve. Join me on this journey to discover what makes England v Scotland the greatest international derby. Let me start this episode again with a huge thanks to the websites of englandfootballonline.com and especially scottishsporthistory.com for the amazing player profile featured in this episode. More of that later. It is easy to forget that by the time we get to this, the fifth official international game, it was still a time of turbulence and huge changes in the world. And nowhere else was this exemplified than in the Wild West. 1876 is the year of the Battle of Little Bighorn in Montana. 300 men of the US 7th Cavalry Regiment under George Armstrong Custer are wiped out by 5,000 Lakota, Cheyenne and Arapaho led by Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse. For those fans of the great TV series Deadwood, this is also the year while Bill Hitchcock is shot whilst playing cards in a saloon in Deadwood, South Dakota, while playing what is now known as the Dead Man's Hand. Born this year is probably World War I's most famous spy, the Dutch-born Mata Hari, who was executed in Paris in 1917. And, as she was facing the firing squad, she refused a blindfold and even had the audacity to blow a kiss to her executioners. In the world of football, England and Scotland at last get some company with the Association of Wales being formed. And Wales would travel to Glasgow for their first international on the 25th of March. Thus, Wales becoming the third oldest international foot team in the world. The Scots won the first fixture, 4 0. In Scotland, we see the formation of Falkirk and Partick Thistle. In England, we see, amongst others, Middlesbrough, Stafford Rangers being formed. Also formed, is the English club, not actually named after any particular place. This is, of course, Robbie Williams' favourite team, Port Vale, their name being a reference to the Valley of Ports and the Trent and the Mersey Canal. They have never played top-flight football and hold the dubious record for the most seasons in the English Football League in the second tier without reaching the first tier. 1876 would see Scottish football's first black player. His name was Robert Gustav Walker and he was born in Sierra Leone to a white Scottish father and a black local woman. He came to Scotland as a child and was brought up near Dumfries and then as a fresh-faced youth came to Glasgow, where he became a member of Queen's Park FC. Although he played for Queen's Park Juniors, he never got into the first team, and in the summer of 1875, he moved to near neighbours for Lanark. Aged just 18, 
his pace in the right wing was a great asset to the team in 1875-76 and he played his part as thirds reached the Scottish Cup final, scoring against Western in the quarter-final and against Dumbarton in the semi-final replay. They came desperately close to lifting the trophy in March 1876, taking the lead in the final, only for Queen's Park to equalise. And then the Hamden Giants won the replay 2-0. Walker's precocious talent was recognised and he was selected twice that season for Scotland international trial matches for the Blues on the 19th of February and the Improbables on the 1st of March without making the final cut. Throughout the 76-77 season, Walker continued to feature on the right wing for third Lanark, occasionally scoring goals, and again was asked to play in a Scotland trial in February, representing Mr McGeoch's team. However, that was as close as he came to an international cap. Perhaps, if he'd given a better showing, he might have become Scotland's first black internationalist. In 1878, Walker's football career came to an end when he left Scotland for Liverpool to pursue a career in marine engineering. And Walker died in Hammersmith in 1936, aged 79. Sadly, there's no gravestone to mark his last resting place in Hammersmith Cemetery. In the English FA Cup, it mirrored the Scottish Cup with a 1-1 draw in the first match, but Wanderers beating Old Etonians 3-0 in the replay at the Oval. My England v Scotland memory of this episode comes from Scotland great Joe Jordan, and it's from the 1974 game at Hamden. He was part of a great Leeds team that had 12 Scottish players in their squad, In such were the times of football, he described how four of those Scotsmen, an Englishman, Norman Hunter, all drove in a car for the game. Quote, We beat England 2-0. I scored. Five of us drove back to Leeds. Me, Billy Bremner, Peter Lorimer, Dave Harvey and Norman Hunter, all in the same car. It was a nightmare for Norman. Billy just sat there, smiling at him. The 1876 game provided two innovations to international football. Firstly, the tape marking the crossbar was sensibly replaced with a wooden bar. Moreover, a half-time break was introduced to allow both a break in play and changes in tactics. And so, on Saturday the 4th of March 1876, England once again faced Scotland at the West of Scotland cricket ground. And with each game, we're seeing an increased interest in the games. And it was estimated that between 12 and 15,000 people flooded in to see the two rivals who were locked together with one win each and two draws. It was long believed that the first pictures of an England squad came from the 1890s, but you and yesterday.com has unearthed a picture of that 1876 England squad, and the photo was sent in by one of the England players from that game. The photo had been sent in the 1920s to the Derbyshire Football Express for inclusion in a bygone style feature. The correspondent was 71-year-old Edgar Field, one of the England players in the photograph, who was living in Little Over, Derby. Edgar Field was born in Wallingford, Berkshire, on the 29th of July, 1854. He was educated at Lansing College, a time when association football was born in 1863, and was not yet a decade old. He was a member of the school's Football 11. After leaving Lansing, 
He played first for Clapham Rovers and later for Reading, the former at that time, one of the foremost association sides in the country. Field had the singular honour of playing in two FA Cups with Rovers. He was capped twice for England at fullback. The photograph was taken on his 1876 debut when he was aged 21. His second and final game came five years later, on the 12th of March, 1881, that too against Scotland. Field also holds the dubious distinction of scoring England's first own goal. Of himself, he said, I was as hard as nails in those days and thought nothing of walking for miles. I was almost six foot in height and scaled thirteen and a half stone. I never looked my weight, although opponents at different times agreed and I felt more. He died in January 1934 at the age of 79. The referee for the game was William Campbell Mitchell of Queen's Park FC, with umpires Godfrey William Turner of Swifts FC and Robert Gardner of Clydesdale, who had been Scotland's keeper for the first four internationals. And so to the teams. Scotland, they lined up with a 2-2-6 and they played dark blue shirts and white shorts. And their team, Alexander McKeogh, goalkeeper, Dumbreck FC, Joseph Taylor, back, Queen's Park FC, John Hunter, back, 3rd Lanark Rifle Volunteers Football Club, Alexander McClintock, half-back, Vale of Leaven FC, Alexander Kennedy, half-back, Glasgow Eastern FC, Henry McNeil, forward, Queen's Park FC, William M. McKinnon, forward, Queen's Park FC, Thomas C. Higgett, forward, Queen's Park FC, William Miller, forward, Third Lanark Rifle Volunteers FC, John Ferguson, forward, Vale of Leaven FC, John C. Baird, forward, Vale of Leaven FC. England also lined up with a 2 2 6, and they actually made 10 changes from the previous match. And they wore white shirts with the English arms and black on the breast, white shorts, and dark blue caps. And they lined up thusly. Arthur H. P. Savage, goalkeeper, Crystal Palace FC. Edgar Field, fullback, Clapham Rovers FC. Frederick Thomas Green, fullback, Wanderers FC and Old Wick Hamas CFC. Ernest H. Bembridge, halfback, Swifts FC. Beaumont G. Jarrett, halfback. Cambridge University FC and Old Harrovians AFC. G. Hubert H. Heron, forward, Wanderers FC and Swifts FC. Walter S. Buchanan, forward, Clapham Rovers FC. W. John Maynard, forward, First Surrey Rifles FC. Charles E. Smith, centre forward, Crystal Palace FC and Wanderers FC. C. Francis W. Heron, centre forward, Wanderers FC. And Arthur W. Kersham, forward, Notts County FC. The match report from the Morning Post on Monday the 6th of March, 1876. The match between the 11 of all England and the 11 of all Scotland, under the association rules, took place on Saturday afternoon in Glasgow in presence of over 15,000 spectators, many of whom paid half a crown for admission. There was quite a storm of rain and wind in the forenoon, so that the ground was in a puddle, although 
the weather had settled when the play began at half past three. The Scotch, winning the toss, played down the hill and at once showed their superiority in combined play, taking a goal within eight minutes. And then another, five minutes later, and a third before half time was called. Sides were changed, but England did not score, so that the match ended with three goals for Scotland and none for England. Jarrett, Smith, Bainbridge, and the two Herons played splendidly for England, but their gallant efforts were repelled. The falls on both sides were numerous, all players being muddy all over at the close. And a slightly biased from Bell's life on Sunday the 5th of March, it was seen at a glance that England did not send our best men to Scotland, but many of those who did appear were no mean exponents of the dribbling game. The Southerns were heavier men, and the experience one could foretell that the condition of the ground would militate materially against their chance. And, as it afterwards turned out, this helped intensify the Northern victory. I do love some of the biased reporting, and, as patriotically Scottish as I am, I will never be biased in this channel. If you've enjoyed this, go to the About section on the channel and click on the Patreon link. It really would help. And with that, until the next game, back in London, bye-bye.